Hey guys, in today's video, I'm going to be going over an absolutely bizarre situation that arose in a recent casual Scrabble game I played against my friend and expert player Steve Bush here in Kentucky. Here was the situation. It was pretty late in the game, and Steve was up 1.332 to 3.31, holding a pretty nice and well-balanced rack of C-E-I-L-P-S-T. There were eight tiles unseen from Steve's perspective, so one in the back and seven on my rack. These tiles he was looking at were A, B, D, F, G, I, N, O. Where this position gets complicated, as all Scrabble pre-end games do, is that it's not a pure end game. Steve doesn't know for sure what's on my rack, because with one in the bag, there are eight different possibilities he has to consider for what could be the one tile in the bag. That was a large part of my reasoning behind my previous play of Fen hooking the E onto Nyx. Not only did this play score pretty well, I also knew that it wouldn't empty the bag, and leaving one in the bag for Steve would significantly complicate his decision compared to emptying the bag. And complicate his decision it did, although at first this doesn't seem like all that complicated a decision. Steve made what seems like by far the most intuitive play here. He scored 39 points and offloaded six of his tiles by playing Splice, hooking the E onto Wii to make U using the triple ward score in the top left corner. What looks great about this play is Steve takes a 40 point lead, and with the T and just one other tile, he's only going to have two tiles on his rack, and usually with just two tiles, you're able to play out on your next turn. And if Steve can take a 40 point lead, and I'm only going to get one more turn before Steve plays out and ends the game on his next play, then almost certainly Steve is going to end up winning this game. However, as we discovered after the game, this play has a pretty crazy pitfall. In the actual game, Steve drew the B out of the bag, so he had a final rack of BT, while I had a rack of ADFGINO. Now, in this position, I noticed that Steve does have two places to go out with his B and his T. He can play on the 12th row through the A and Qua with Bat, also inserting his B to make abs. And he can also play the word Bit with two Ts, B-I-T-T, -T, down the H column through the word It on the board. So, with two places for Steve to play out on complete opposite sides of the board, I can't block both, and I can't score nearly enough points here, so I am lost. And I did indeed lose this game. I played GIF over here for 17 to block Steve's higher scoring outplay. Steve went out with his other outplay of Bit for 6, and Steve did indeed end up winning this game by a final score of 387 to 348. So, what's the pitfall here? As I was looking at this position, before I noticed that Steve had two different outplays, I noticed he was actually awfully close to having very, very few places to play either his B or his T individually. And this gave me the thought, what if he had drawn something maybe instead of the B that didn't give him two outplays? Is it conceivable that Steve could maybe end up stuck with his T? Now, I know that sounds crazy, guys. If you've been around the Scrabble scene long enough, you've probably come across some tile stick endgames, but usually tiles people get stuck with are those such as the Q or the V, which doesn't make any two other words. It's almost unheard of to hear of someone getting stuck with a tile as flexible as a T. But as Steve and I analyzed this game after it finished, we realized that if Steve had drawn something other than the B, he could have actually ended up in this exact situation, and I might have ended up winning the game. Let me show you guys how this might have worked. Let's see what would have happened if, after Steve's play of Splice, he didn't draw the B as he did in the actual game, but instead he drew the D. And you're probably thinking, well, that's probably even better for Steve, right? Generally, a D is a more flexible tile than a B. Well, this is not like most usual situations, because if Steve draws the D, I'm going to have A, B, F, G, I, N, O. And I'm going to see that Steve is now only threatening one outplay, namely Tad through the A and Qua making ats. Dit, D-I-T-T, -T, is not a word like bit, B-I-T-T -T is, so Steve doesn't have another outplay. And watch what happens if I block Steve's outplay down below. Let's say I do something like bag for 20 points. So Steve is still up 20 here, and although he doesn't go out, it seems like he should surely be able to play off his two tiles in succession, one after the other, which should still be enough for him to win, because with A, F, I, N, O left, I'm not going to be playing out on his next turn. Here's the problem, though, guys. While Steve has several places for both his D and his T, they're all too close to each other. 
With his D right now, he has three places. He can play Demo, hooking Emo, Dit above It, and then Sod from the SO, which you guys will notice is very, very close to the spot for Demo. For his T, he only has two places, and they're in the same spots as the places for his D, Sot and Tit. So what's going to happen, guys, is when Steve uses one of these two areas of the board on this turn, I'm going to block the other area on my next turn, and Steve is going to end up stuck with whatever tile he doesn't play right now. So let's say Steve plays Demo, which makes sense. It's his highest scoring play right now and leaves his lower scoring tile. Then I'm going to block Tit. The best way to do that looks to be Ixia for 16 points. And Steve, right now, guys, as hard as it is to believe, is T-stuck. Pause the video for a couple seconds, look around this board, and see if you can find a spot for Steve's T. You're not going to succeed. There is none. And I know it sounds crazy, because this board is fairly closed, but it's not that bad a board. But there is simply nowhere for Steve's T to go. So Steve has to pass. And then I can take my time here. I don't even need to go out because Steve is going to have to continue passing. I do just have to be very careful that if I slow play this, I don't accidentally give Steve a new spot for his T. For instance, something like of an OS here would be a catastrophic blunder as it would allow Steve to go out with oft winning the game. So a better play here is just oft an F on the bottom, which gives Steve nowhere for his T. I've actually already tied the game up now and Steve has to pass again. And I could slow play this one more time if I wanted to. Most simply here, just go out with Joe and No, and I'd win the game by 13 points here. This isn't my best sequence, but it wins pretty convincingly. And none of Steve's other plays work in the original position. One interesting trap he could try to set is playing Sot instead of Demo, because if he does this, then Ixia no longer works for me. In this position, I cannot play Ixia through the XI because it would allow Steve to drop his D, making Diff and Dit going out and winning on the spot. So I have to be a little bit more careful. But something like Knit for 3, as simple as that looks, gets the job done easily because now Steve is actually D stuck. He has to pass and I can just play off one tile at a time here. I'm not sure the following is my best sequence but it works easily. F for 11, pass, followed by Chi for 13, pass, followed by Pa for 8, Pass, and finally Joe for 9 to go out, and I win very comfortably 399 to 374. It also doesn't help Steve in the original position to play first with it. He definitely doesn't want to play dit because that allows me big plays hooking the A to play a dit. And if he plays tit, then he's going to end up D stuck again. Because I can simultaneously block both sod and demo by playing sung for 3. And now he's stuck and he'd have to pass. I won't go through all the details here, but I'll leave you guys to check. That being down only 20 and with Steve D stuck, I'm easily getting enough points with AFIO with a very similar sequence to the one I just showed you before. So in sum, in this position, if Steve plays Splice and then draws DT after I do something like Bag on the bottom right, Steve is sunk. He has two spots for his D and his T, but whichever one he uses, the other one is getting blocked and he is going to get stuck and lose. There is no way for him out of this. So amazingly, his play of Splice loses if he draws a D. But that's not all. In the original position, after Splice, Steve is also going to get in trouble if he draws a G besides drawing a D, as we just saw. If that happens, it's going to be a very similar demise for Steve as the one we just saw after he draws a D. So I'm going to have A, B, D, F, I, N, O, and I'm going to start very similarly here. I can just play bad for 20 points, stopping Steve from playing tag through that same A. And it's the same situation basically as before. He actually only has one spot for his G in this case, just Git for four points. He currently has two spots for his T, Sot and Tit. So if he plays Sot, then it's pretty obvious what's going to happen. I'm going to block his G spot, and I'll leave you guys to check. I'm going to win easily. And the problem with playing Git is while he does get rid of his G, he blocks one of his two T spots, because as I mentioned, he only has Sot and Tit. Now he only has Sot. And just like we saw in the variant where he drew the D, I'm going to play Sun for three points and stop him from going out. He, once again, is T stuck. He has to pass. And I won't go through this whole sequence again here, guys. It's very easy to see that if I play off one or a couple tiles at a time, again, as long as I'm careful not to accidentally give Steve a T spot, I'm going to win this game comfortably. So once again, guys, it's the same thing. 
If Steve draws the G, then if I play on the bottom right, he is not going to be able to play off both of these tiles in time. Whichever spot he uses on this turn, the other spot is going to get blocked by me, and he is going to get stuck and lose. It turns out that in the original pre-endgame position, Steve's only so-called draws of death if he plays splice are the D and the G. Any other tile Steve pulls from the bag will result in a win. We saw that in the case where Steve draws the B, which is what actually happened during the game. It's very easy to see that Steve wins if he draws any of the three vowels, the A, the I, or the O, as he's going to have multiple outplays in different parts of the board that I can't simultaneously block. The cases of him drawing the F and the N are a little interesting, though, and worth a quick explanation. Let's start with the F. If he draws the F, then he's threatening to play out with aft from the A and qua. So let's say I do something very similar to what I've been doing all along and play bad over here for 20 points. Now, guys, the key difference is Steve has a spot for his F that's not one of his two T spots. We saw in the cases where he drew the D or the G that his only places for those two tiles interfered with one of his two spots for the T, and that's what led to him being stuck and losing. But here, he can drop his F with often F for 11 points in the bottom part of the board. And the key here is he still has both tit and sot, and I cannot block both of them at once. I also can't score nearly enough points to erase my 30-point deficit here, so with Steve going out on his next turn, he is going to escape with a win if he draws the F. It's a fairly similar mechanism if he draws the N after splice. He's once again threatening an out through the A and qua, this time either and or tan. So if I make, once again, my play of bad, to block that, then Steve cannot go out with NT. But it's just like the F, because now Steve has spots for his N that don't interfere with his T spots. He can play either ANTA for 4 in the bottom left, or slightly better, not in uni, next to instated. If Steve does this, then just as the case we looked at right before this, I cannot block both SOT and TIT on my next turn. And I also do not have the ability to score enough with my F to erase my 25-point deficit, so Steve will win in this situation when he draws the N. So, in sum, Steve's play of splice in the original position wins 6 out of 8, or 75% of the time. Losing when he draws the D or the G, winning when he draws any of the 6 other tiles. And when Steve and I realized this in our post-game analysis, the natural question became, well, did Steve have a better play than Splice in this original position? It's hard to imagine, because Splice, again, at first looks like such a good play. It scores really well, and it keeps only one tile, which seemingly should allow Steve to go out quickly, which is exactly what he wants in this kind of position. It's just that it runs into that freak T-stick situation that's very hard to foresee in advance. And it turns out that Steve does have, in this position, two plays that will win with all eight draws. They're both very creative and tough to see. I was able to find one of them in the post-game analysis, and the other one was found by the engine Makondo. Let me quickly show you guys each of those. One particularly sneaky way for Steve to guarantee himself a win here involves playing just a single tile, the complete opposite of Steve's play, which strove to play as many tiles as he could to ensure an outplay on his next turn. One of Steve's always winning plays is pit for five points with the idea of setting up a very difficult-to-block spit on the triple word score, which will allow Steve to play horizontally with a word ending with an S for a boatload of points on his next turn. Now, it's not completely trivial to be able to permute that this guarantees a win with all eight draws, and I won't go through all the details. But I'll show just one example of how this setup scores so many points that it'll outrun even a strong out-and-two sequence on my end. Let's say that Steve draws the B, as he did in the actual game. Then, if I respond with fading for 22 points from the F and Fen, ignoring Steve's setup, Steve is going to respond with Bices for a whopping 54 points. Now, I still cut it fairly close after I go out with Of, which I sneakily set up with fading for 24, but Steve will hold on and win by 10, with a final score of 391 to 381 when all is said and done. Now, you might be wondering, well, okay, could I try to instead block Steve's setup on this turn? Absolutely, I could play something like Gap for 12 points, but the problem is, if I block Steve's setup here, well, there's two problems. Problem number one is I'm not going to be scoring a lot of points myself, and problem number two is I can only do it while playing just a couple of tiles. And if I only play two tiles on this turn, I'm still going to be left with five tiles for my next play. 
And it's not that hard to see that with five tiles on this board, I'm almost certainly not going to be playing out on my next turn. So with a play like Gap, I do take a small lead, in this case six points, but I'll leave you guys to check. Steve can then just go out into elsewhere on the board and pretty comfortably outrun me and win this endgame. So this is kind of the two-fold idea with Pit. If I don't block, then Steve scores so many points that he outruns me even if I play out in two, as I did with Fading and Of. And if I do block, then Steve basically simplifies his problem. Because in the original position where he played Pit, it was challenging because there was still one in the bag and that caused him a lot of uncertainty. If he plays Pit for just a couple of points and I block with something like Gap for just a couple of points, then we've basically traded low scoring plays, the game is still more or less tied, but now Steve is in a much easier position to work with. Because the bag is empty and he is still on turn, but he doesn't have the uncertainty. So he's going to have seven tiles, I'm going to probably have around five tiles, and he'll be able to now accurately plan an out into endgame sequence that should win the game easily. So he basically pushes the game one turn ahead, converting a complicated, uncertain position into a much easier, certain position. That is the mechanism by which Pitt in this original position wins with all eight draws. Again, I'm not going to go through all eight of them in detail, since that would take a long time, but I'll leave you guys to check that regardless of what Steve draws, whether it's the B as I just showed, or any of the seven other tiles, then he's going to win after Pitt. I can't score enough with an out and two to outrun his high scoring play on the triple, and I don't have any blocks that are effective enough to win. Now, Steve has one more play in this position besides Pitt that wins with all eight draws. And it's a fairly similar idea. Lap for 14 points through the A and Claw, setting up a difficult to block S hook with laps. Now, the hook isn't quite as strong because the S itself doesn't land on the triple word score. But he keeps a fantastic leave with C E I S T, and he threatens outplays on the O column with a lot of consonants he could draw from the bag. In particular, if he draws the B as he did during the game, he threatens bisect. If he draws the D, he threatens edicts. And if he draws the G, he threatens jestic. If Steve threatens an outplay over there, it's not too hard to see that he's going to win. I absolutely have to block his outplay, and it's very difficult for me to do without, once again, like we talked about with Pitt, scoring very few points and playing very few tiles. If that happens, then Steve is going to be able to go out into elsewhere and win the game. The most interesting case here is when Steve draws the F, because then he doesn't have an outplay threat down the O column. And I actually have a sneaky idea that almost wins me the game, but will fall just short. Let me show you. If Steve plays lap and draws the F, I'm going to have this rack, which actually makes the word aboting, but that doesn't play. I can play 8 for 3 points to the it on the board, with a very clever idea of setting up a super difficult to block boating and gate on my next turn. Now it turns out that Steve's best play here is Etna to this NA for just 5 points, which blocks boating and gate. However, this results in a very complex endgame sequence that'll eventually end with Steve winning by just 4 points. Steve's much more straightforward and humanly calculable win is to just ignore my setup and cash in on his with Feisses for 40 points. After I play Boating for 48, Steve is going to barely hold on winning by 2, 386 to 384. Again, I'm not going to go through all 8 possible draws for Steve after lap, just like I didn't with Pit. I don't want this video to end up being super long, but I'll leave it to you guys as an exercise if you're so inclined to show that Steve does indeed win all of the end games after lap. So, there you have it guys. This is yet another Scrabble position, and a pre-end game in particular, where the conventional approach is incorrect. The conventional approach with these type of positions is usually to try to score a lot of points, play a lot of tiles, and go out quickly. That's exactly what Steve did with his play of Splice. But it runs into a freak situation that you hardly expect to see over a Scrabble board, where he can get T-stuck if he draws the wrong tiles out of the bag. So instead, Steve needs to do the opposite. He needs to play very few tiles and take advantage of having the last S and set himself up. That's the biggest lesson, guys, from this position. Whenever you have the last of any tile in a Scrabble game, especially if that tile is an S, that puts you in a very powerful position. Because it allows you to create setups that your opponent cannot use. And in many cases, cannot block at all or cannot block without undergoing a significant sacrifice on their own end. Steve's two plays here that guarantee himself a win are both as setups. Pit for 5 and lap for 14. 
Both of these plays win eight out of eight times. So really, really hard position to solve over the board. Steve also didn't have that much time on the clock at this point, but super instructive. Really hope you guys learned something from this video and we'll always just take a second whenever you're going into any position like this, just look over the board and make sure you really do have multiple spots for all of the tiles that you have because you just never know. You might end up piece stuck and losing the game because of that, which would be a pretty brutal way to lose. Steve, fortunately for him here, unfortunately for me, did manage to evade his T-stick, but again, two out of eight times, he might not have gotten so lucky and might have ended up stuck with a T and on the losing end of this one. So really cool position here, guys. A lot to learn from this. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Shout out to Steve for taking the time to get together and play and always giving me fun and interesting games. And I will see you all soon for the next video. Thanks again, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye.